friends, Elisa Childers here. Today, we're gonna talk about feminism and Christianity. Are they compatible? What do we do with all the messages our culture is sending us about what it means to be a woman? What does the Bible say about who we are as women in Christ? Does the Bible oppress women? We're gonna discuss all these things and more with a very special guest on today's podcast. Don't go running for the hills just because you heard we're talking about feminism and women. We're going to be getting into some subjects that are really important and interesting, and they're things that we all need to learn about and know about as followers of Christ in this modern world. So I'm super excited about my guest today, Diana Williams. She specializes in the Christian response to feminism and things like feminist theology and what is called the feminist critique of the Bible. In other words, there are feminists who would say that the Bible oppresses women, that Christianity as an entire belief system is oppressive to women, and we need to break free of some of these archaic ideas that are trying to keep us enslaved to this idea of uh, subordination or inferiority. Diana holds an honorary Bachelor's of Science degree with a double major in psychology and sociology from the University of Toronto, and she has her master's degree from Southern Evangelical Seminary in apologetics and philosophy. She's passionate to help equip college kids and university students to defend their faith on their secular campuses and also when they go out into the world and enter the marketplace. She travels both nationally and internationally to speak at universities, churches, women's conferences, communities. Community events. She's a contributing author to a book called Basics of Biblical Criticism, Helpful or Harmful, where her chapter focused on feminist theology. She's also a member of the speaking team for the International Society of Women in Apologetics. So Diana Williams, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Lisa. It's good to be with you. Well, you and I met about a year ago at the Southern Evangelical Seminary's big apologetics conference that they do every year, and I saw this lecture that had to do with the feminist critique of the Bible, and I thought, well, that sounds really interesting. So a friend of mine and I attended your lecture, and we were both just so impressed with your knowledge and your wisdom on this subject. So when you agreed to come on the podcast, I was excited because I want my listeners to reap the benefit of getting to hear from you on these subjects. So you've studied apologetics and philosophy. What is it that first got you interested in studying the subject of feminism? Well, it's a a very interesting uh, story, Elisa. It's not something uh, that I chose, uh, so I guess you could say it chose me. But what happened is that a few years ago, the seminary was contacted, Southern Evangelical Seminary was contacted by a local Ratio Christi club because they had been approached by the atheist and agnostic group uh, who was looking to debate some Christians. Uh, They wanted to debate some Christians on the question of, does Christianity oppress women? And so the Ratio uh, Christi group contacted us at the seminary. At that time, it was a a colleague of myself who were working there, and we decided that that was a worthwhile discussion to have. And so for several months, we, we started investigating, we started researching, we started studying. Now, neither one of us had studied uh, feminism in our undergraduate work, but we knew that feminism was the thing that was driving the question of does Christianity oppress women? And so really that is what uh, got me into studying feminism. But long story short, a week before this discussion was set to take place on campus, They canceled the debate. They backed out of it. And the reason they gave us, and I quote, is that we knew too much about the Bible and they didn't. So uh, the discussion didn't happen. We were very, well, we were a little bit disappointed about that. But we thought, uh, why not continue talking about this? Why not continue talking about this notion of Christianity and whether it's oppressive to women? Because it's something that it's not just a question that's being asked on campus. It's being asked in the churches as well. And so that's kind of 
the long version of how I, I began studying a, a feminism that led to, to me focusing on feminist theology ultimately. Wow. And and interestingly, I think there's a lot of Christian women that aren't really aware that this is something that people say. Uh, You know, like the average Christian woman, in my experience, isn't aware that people think the Bible oppresses women or that Christianity in some way oppresses women. So I'm glad we're we're getting the the word out a little bit (laughs) about how to interact with some of those ideas. So when I think about feminism, and I think when a lot of Christian women think about feminism— I mean, there's aspects of it that we we like. I mean, we don't want women to be oppressed, right? I mean, right. I'm glad that I can vote. I'm glad I can own property. Mm-hmm. Uh, believe it's biblical to be viewed as equal with men in regard to our humanity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but admittedly, I watched recently this women's march and was just perplexed by it because I'm I'm looking at all these women marching and finding myself not relating with it at all, and even being. Uh, a bit repulsed by a lot of what I saw going on. And I think that I can speak for a lot of Christian women when I say that we were feeling this the same way about it when we watched the news and saw the the videos on Facebook and Twitter and all of this. So uh, maybe it would help us if you give us a little bit of background on the feminist movement and particularly here in America, what's the history behind it? How did we get to where we are as a culture in regard to feminism? Sure. So uh, I'll actually begin just by uh, defining feminism, feminism being the social and cultural movement beginning in the 19th century in this country that sought to secure equal rights for women based on equality of the sexes. Certainly, uh, it wouldn't do anyone any good to deny the very obvious truth that there was a point in time in history where women were not treated equally, where, where they were seen as uh, inferior to, to males just by virtue of being women. And so the feminist uh, movement emerged recognizing that there were very clear differences in how women were being treated. Now, uh, feminism in this country has enjoyed what are called waves. Uh, there have been uh, waves of feminism, first wave, second wave, third wave. And so the first wave of feminism, uh, again, began in the 1800s. And the first wave feminists were really concerned about three things. They were concerned about the right to own property, the right to enter into contract, and the right to vote. Very largely speaking, that's what consumed their time uh, in the 1800s. Uh, dates are malleable. But if we're to pick out a date when the first wave ended, we'll say that it ended in 1920, which is when women got the right to vote in this country. And so that ended the first wave. And between 1920 and 1950, there was something very major happening in the world that prevented the feminists from being uh, as vocal as they had been uh, before. And that was the world war. And so when uh, all of the things surrounding the world war happened that led uh, the men to leaving. Uh, They had to to fight and the women left their homes and they entered into the workforce. And so between the 20, 1920 and 1950, roughly speaking, there really was not a lot going on on uh, the feminist record. Then the second wave of feminism uh, began when the the world war ended. Uh, again, dates are rough, but in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, that's when we'll say the second wave of feminism came to bear in this country. And if you think about the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, and what was happening here in America, you'll quickly uh, see that the second wave of feminists were talking about very different things. And so mm-hmm. the sexual revolution had already been underway. If you think about uh, Hugh Hefner and <laughs> the Playboy Mansion and the pushing of sexual uh, limits as far as women's behavior was concerned. If you think about that and you think about um, the civil rights movement that was going on and uh, those sorts of things in the 50s, 60s, uh, and 70s, if you think about Roe v. Wade, uh, abortion becoming legal in this country in 1973, divorce, no fault divorce became legal in 1969. So all of these things were happening when the second wave of feminism was really coming to maturity. So that really changed the discussion, if you will. 
And then the third wave of feminism really represents uh, in-house fighting, if you will, between the, the third wave and the second wave feminist. Uh, because the third wave uh, of feminists, they recognize that the concerns and the attention um, that was being paid uh, to certain issues was not... Uh, representing all women. And so the second wave feminists, if we're to be completely honest, they represented white middle class interests, white middle class women interests in this country. But again, this was the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and there were a lot of things that black women uh, uh, were experiencing in this country that second wave feminists really weren't speaking about uh, in a large way or really weren't um, weren't wanting or even uh, campaigning to, to correct. And so the third wave of feminism emerged to address that shortcoming, if you will. But it's not just a shortcoming that can be identified here in the West. If you think about the world at large and the experiences of women at, at large in the world, they are, for the most part, very different than the experiences of white middle class uh, American women. And so the third wave emerged to address the shortcomings of the second wave of feminism. So would you say we're still in the third wave or is there a fourth? Is the, <laughs> there a fourth coming? <laughs> Where are we? Well, I wouldn't be um, opposed to either of uh, those things being true. I think that a case can be made on both sides. As far as the fourth wave, uh, I would say that we probably are in a fourth wave only because the category of woman is under deconstruction, under construction. Um, now, it just happens to be the case that we're really even not too clear what it means to be a woman, what it doesn't mean to be a woman. And so if there is a fourth wave, it, it exists because of that confusion, if you will. But then again, um, I, I think that a case can be made that we're still in the third wave because there are still experiences that are being had by women all over the world that the that um, white middle class uh, American women that the second wave feminists, largely speaking, still aren't addressing. And so if you think about what's happening in certain countries where women are um, treated just brutally, just brutally treated horribly, you don't necessarily see a strong contingent of uh, feminists going to address those concerns. So in a very real sense, I would say that the third wave still needs to exist because the disparities of attention still exist. Right, right. And, and a perfect example of that would be that you don't see a lot of feminists advocating the rights of women who are oppressed in the Middle East, for example, uh, under ideologies that would devalue them. That's very interesting. You would think that whenever there, um, whenever there was widespread mistreatment of women in certain countries, that is clear to us all because of social media and because of news and all of these things. Mm -hmm. You would think that because those things are happening in certain countries, that uh, the second wave would be very vocal about it, would be very clear about it, would be very um, proactive about it, but, but they're not. And it just seems to be the case a lot of times that the second wave of feminism has a different agenda mm -hmm. other than restoring equal treatment to women across the board. And you bring up such an interesting point uh, when you defined the first wave you said equality, they were going for equality of the sexes, but you rightly brought up that we're sort of in a time now where the whole category of woman and the whole category of man is being rethought and redefined. So you can't really have equality between two different things if you can't even uh, identify or define what they actually are. So would, would you say that the feminist movement in America really has had some kind of an influence on what is now happening in the LGBTQ activist movement and even the transgender movement. So I would definitely say that the feminist movement was a forerunner to a lot of the social movements that we're seeing today in terms of the homosexual movement, in terms of the transgender movement, uh, the LGBT movement. The feminist movement was certainly a forerunner in the very same way that the civil rights movement happened to be a forerunner and caused a lot of other things to happen in this country. The feminist movement um, 
if you will, had the same effect in, in the sense that it kind of was the first domino that got others dropping. Mm. So when people say things like gender is just a social construct, what would you say to that? I would say that they are wrong <laughs> for uh, many different reasons. Gender is not uh, a social contract. It's very interesting. The, the things that people uh, echo or the things that people say uh, unknowingly, perhaps, um, those things are, be, are they're very heavy philosophical assertions. Um, so when we're talking about social constructs, when we're talking about, um, you know, uh, we're talking about reality, when we're talking about the categories of reality and those sorts of things, that's its own philosophical uh, discussion. But what I'll say in this context is that uh, gender is, is not a social construct. It's actually metaphysically related to sex right. in the sense that there would be we would not be having a discussion about gender today if sex did not exist, right? So uh, if we looked out into the world and all we saw were men, there was no such thing as women. If all we saw were men in the world, big men, small men, tall men, short men, if all we saw were men, I would argue that we would not be talking about gender because there's just one thing. Right. There's no need to uh, incorporate another um, another way to talk about it. We could just talk about men without having to talk about gender. But the, the very fact that we can look out into the world and we can see that there's humanity, but humanity is different. There are male humans and there are female humans. Uh, there are very clear differences between males and females as anyone who spends any time with men uh, know that men are very different than women and men would very well say the same thing about women <laughs> the men and women are just very different and so cultures up until our culture cultures have always just found a way to distinct the sexes one from the other and so whether that's appearance whether that's dress whether that's mannerisms whether that is vocations even in some sense um we, we just would want to say that cultures have always distincted men from women. Now it can't be say it can't be said that um, the roles and the mannerisms and the behaviors that they reduce to sex. It's not that we're saying that everyone with long hair is a woman. We're not saying that. We're not saying right. that everyone who washes the dishes well is a female. We're not saying that. We're just saying that cultures have found a way to distinct the differences, and that has been advantageous in culture yeah. when, when you're able to look out in the world and distinct as um, distinct two things, one from the other. That's just It's just very natural to do that. It's only our culture that has kicked against the pricks, if you will, and is finding a way to dismantle what common sense has dictated to be the case the whole time. And so, again, going back to the, uh, the supposed or the alleged fourth wave of feminism, if there is a fourth wave of feminism, it's because we've got lost in the category that um, our reason tells us exists, but maybe for other reasons we want to deny it does. Right, and we're going to, in a moment, we're going to shift gears and get into a little bit of this feminist critique of the Bible that where feminists would say, that the Bible oppresses women or that Christianity oppresses women. Uh, but it's interesting to note that as, as I was listening to you talk, I was thinking about how the Bible depicts the sexes. The overarching narrative of the entire Bible is that hmm. there are two different sexes. There are males and there are females, and both are made in the image of God. And really when they come together is when they are more of a complete reflection of right. the image of God, which is uh, really such a beautiful and a, and a positive thing, not an, an oppressive thing. And even, you know, just biologically, our bodies have a complete skeletal system. Our bodies have a complete nervous mm -hmm. system, a complete mm -hmm. circulatory system. But we have one half of a reproductive system. Mm 
And so when, when the male and the female come together, that makes a whole reproductive system to produce a child. And right. that really is something to be celebrated, something that is beautiful. And sometimes it just makes me sad that our culture has gotten to the point where they would actually see that as hate speech, you know? <laughs> yeah, that, that's definitely where we are. I, our culture is so weird that um, obvious truths, obvious to uh, our senses, truths that are obvious to our senses, certainly truths that are obvious to our intellect can at the same time be termed hate speech. That That's just yeah. uh, quite interesting um, to me. Well, speaking of hate, <laughs> so let's talk about this idea that the Bible oppresses women. Uh, I've heard from feminists and, and uh, even feminist theologians that this idea of sin being introduced to the world is all blamed on Eve, that the bi this would be the claim, mm -hmm. right? This is not what we believe, mm -hmm. but this is what is being mm -hmm. claimed, that everything gets blamed on Eve. Uh, and even the idea of her becoming subordinate to man happened because mm -hmm. of the fall and as if she in some way is the representation sure. of all that is evil. What would you say about that? Uh, well, as to the first question, uh, claim this idea that in Eve uh, we find the genesis of evil. I would just say that that's not biblically accurate. Um, you know, a careful reading of Romans 5 uh, will very well um, confirm that e that sin entered the world through one man. It entered the world through Adam. It doesn't say that it entered the world uh, through so it actually Eve. blames Adam, not Eve. It actually blames Adam, but conveniently that's forgotten when it comes to um, this sort of discussion. And then the other thing that I'll say in terms of subordination. Interestingly, the subordination of Eve to Adam, it didn't occur after the fall. It occurred before the fall. So whatever we want to say about it, I think that we have to clearly say that this subordination, this order, this structure, it happened before the fall. I think a strong case can be made that after the fall happened, after sin entered the world, things got really messy, things got really muddy because now we're dealing with a sinful nature. But it's a very different thing to say that subordin subordination happened after the fall. That's not, that's not what the biblical text indicates at all. And interestingly, uh, I took a, a class from Dallas Theological Seminary on the book of Genesis. And he noted, the, the professor noted that the when the Bible uses the word helper, that God was going to make a helper for Adam. Mm -hmm, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of times we hear that word and it sounds like, like oh, he's creating a slave for Adam or some kind of or servant. Or a maid or something. Right. Yeah, yeah, his handmaid yeah. or something. Yeah. But that word is actually the same word that's used to describe the Holy Spirit in, mm -hmm. uh, in the text as well, which I thought was so interesting. It's interesting. I mean, I think when you just kind of study these things in the, in, in the uh, original languages, there's uh, the interesting factor goes off of the meter because you're just studying. You get so much more clarity in uh, the original languages. But I think that your point is, is very well made. It's not... It's only our modern uh, day notions of mm. certain words. So our modern day notions of helper automatically it triggers this um, idea of subservience. But that's something that we're bringing to the text. Automatically, when we hear the word subordination, we're, we think about uh, lesser value. But that's something that we're bringing to the text. When we hear the word uh, patriarchy, automatically we're bringing something uh, negative to the text. But the real question is, what did the text mean for the individuals to whom it was given? Exactly. So let's talk about that word patriarchy, because you say you see this word all over social media. You see it mm -hmm. uh, when I was seeing posts about the Women's March. Everything was about the patriarchy. And it like there's sure. this room of men somewhere that are ruling the world. Like, who are I the patriarchy? Where no are they? idea where they are, what <laughs> continent they are. Do they talk to each other? I just see them and, in some dark yeah. room, all smoking cigars, yeah. planning all yeah. the oppression of women in the world. But, right, but right. joking aside, uh, what is patriarchy? And is there a biblical version of patriarchy that's actually really positive? 
Yes. So I'll, I'll begin by saying that patriarchy, just linguistically speaking, uh, etymologically speaking, patriarchy means rule of fathers. It does not mean rule of men. Pater means father and archy means rule. So just this idea that patriarchy means uh, rule of men, that's not consistent with linguistics uh, in, in that sense. In another sense, I'll say that sociological patriarchy is something that we should be very concerned with, uh, Christian or otherwise. So sociological patriarchy, this idea that social institutions have been designed uniquely for men to be advantageous to men, um, we reject that. And so a feminist understanding of marriage uh, a feminist understanding of uh, a family, it enshrines this notion that they are um, oppressive structures to, to women. We, we deny that. So we deny the validity of sociological patriarchy, but we very well want to affirm the value of fathers ruling and fathers ruling well. Those are two very different things. Right, because the, the biblical definition of patriarchy has a more protective tone, doesn't it? It absolutely uh, does. And it, it just does one well to do proper hermeneutics, as, as you've mentioned before. So when we understand the culture, the society, that uh, the people uh, that the biblical text was given to, we understand that, um, you know, they didn't have social welfare offices. They didn't have departments of health. They didn't have departments of education. They didn't have departments of finance. Everything happened in a family. It wasn't the case uh, where, where individuals woke up in the morning and they left to go to work. No, everyone right. stayed in the home, right? So in, in that sort of environment, there had to be a certain amount of order. There had to be a certain amount of um, authority. There had to be a certain amount of responsibility given to the person who was tasked with making sure that the family ran well. Uh, I liken that to uh, our contemporary um, our contemporary understanding of, of of work. When we go to work, when we have deadlines, when we have a project, when we have something that needs to be done, and we as individuals are completely responsible for that, we expect a certain amount of authority to be able to do what needs to happen in order for us to meet our deadline, in order for us to get our goal. None of us would want to be in a situation where we we have been tasked with the responsibility for something, but we haven't been given the power to execute it well. And so the very same thing is what I'll say uh, when it comes to fathers ruling well. Fathers have authority only because they are responsible for that which has been entrusted to them. Right. And you mentioned hermeneutics. And for our listeners who may not be familiar with that word, hermeneutics is the study of interpreting the Bible. It's the proper way to interpret the text. And one of the things that's a principle of hermeneutics is that you take it within its historical and cultural context. And one mm -hmm. mistake that so many modern people make, and uh, it's, it's something I continually try to learn more about so that I'm not making that mistake, is that we bring a contemporary lens to a very ancient text. I mean, we are talking about about a time in history when if the crops failed, families could starve to death. Women couldn't Absolutely. just get go out and get a job and be independent and live on their own. It just wasn't that kind of a culture. And so right. it, when we read, when we expect an ancient culture to have 2017 values, uh, first it isn't fair, and it's right. it's really plucking it out of its cultural context, much like if people in uh, you know 2090 look back at 2017 and say, oh, they were so backwards on this or that. Uh, it, it wouldn't be a fair reading of, of what we would be writing either. So you have to kind of take things right. within their context. And one, one story that this happens a lot with is the story of Jacob and Rachel. Uh, modern people look at the story where Jacob works seven years for Rachel and they think, mm -hmm. my goodness, he's working for her. Is she just a piece of property? What's going on with that? So mm -hmm. what would you say about the story of Jacob and Rachel? Uh, you know, that's funny. I was at an event and uh, a young uh, man brought that that story up to me as if to say, see, Rachel is treated like just like she's a piece of property, just like she's an animal. And the first thing that came to my mind is I don't know anywhere 
where the Bible tasks a man to work seven years for a cow. I don't see that anywhere. Um, but I'll say that the Jacob and Rachel story, it is, uh, it just symbolizes this idea that things that are of value need to be worked for. Now, today, that it, it sounds very uh, harsh to our ears today, but that's just because today we don't we don't think that people have to work for us. And in the context of relationships, I'll say it this way. Today we are in a culture where, for the most part, young women don't expect men to work for them. There's there's really not a lot, and I'm, this is a generality, but there really is not a lot of um, expectations um, on on um, on what needs to be done to get my attention. Mm-hmm. Right. So you, it's it's almost like saying. You don't get my attention just because you paid me a compliment or you don't get my attention because you look really good. You actually have to do Mm. something. You have to work for me. And I'm not monetizing that. I'm not saying you have to have X number of dollars. You have to have this job. It's just this notion, this idea that anything that's worth it, anything that is of value needs to be worked for. In the context of male-female relationships, we don't really think about things that way, but it seems to be the case that we think that way with other things. So if you and I have a goal, if you and I have a dream, if you and I want to accomplish something in our life, we very well think that that thing has to be worked for. We don't think that we're going to wake up tomorrow and we're going to have that thing just because we want it. There has to be some effort uh, paid to it. And the very same thing in this context, uh, the, the fact that uh, Jacob worked seven years for Rachel, it signifies the value that he placed on her. Um, and it wasn't the sort of thing where, uh, uh, where Laban, Rachel's father, was just going to allow his daughter to, to be... Um, to be cared for by someone who couldn't demonstrate that he had the ability to do that. I think that in our culture today, that Jacob and uh, Rachel's story is lost on us because we've just lost this notion that if you want my time, you don't get it just because you ask for it. You actually have to earn it. Yeah, and that's kind of countercultural because we have so broken down uh, the gender roles in our culture that it's it's almost mm-hmm. like insulting to to a woman to even be worked for or valued in that way. But when I read this story, I'm seeing the the high value that the text is putting on the woman because, like you said, you don't work seven years for something that you don't value. And so, well, let's close yeah. with this. So we've talked a lot about the things that we wouldn't agree with, the things that we would say are bad ideas. But behind every bad idea and behind every disagreement, there's something beautiful and positive that we're defending and protecting. So what would you say is the positive, the the elevated status of women in scripture, the thing that we're saying we reject this idea because we think that this is so much more powerful and beautiful and true? Well, you know, I would want to say, and this might be um, a bold claim, but I would want to say that the Bible itself upholds the notion that there is equality of the sexes, right? So it, mm-hmm. it, it makes a very clear distinction between men and women, um, and, and that distinction, it, it bears in the Bible, but it also bears in our common experiences, it bears out in anthropology, anthropological studies, sociological studies, neurobiological studies. So men and women are very well different, but the Bible is also going to say that that men and women are equal. Both of them are equally made in the image and in the likeness of God. Both of them are equally um, recipients of salvation if if Jesus Christ is uh, chosen as one savior, there's there's no difference in value between men and women. And so the very broad definition of feminism that I've mentioned earlier it is an antagonistic to what the Bible is going to say, what the Bible affirms in terms of the sexes being equal. Um, uh, the other thing that I'll say is that the biblical uh in the biblical text, as in everyday life, we're dealing with sinful people, people who uh, right. do things wrong, people who mess up, people who willfully and um, um, treacherously want to do 
wrong. It's in that context that this biblical text is given where we're called to go higher. Uh, we're called to always be warned against our sinful nature. Um, but that doesn't mean that we eradicate the very clear differences between men and women. The Bible is just calling us not to be sinners as we understand that difference. Right. All right. Well, I am going to post some links uh, in the podcast notes. If you want Diana to come and speak at your church or your women's conference or your college group, uh, she would love to do that. And I will post a link on how you can get in touch with her about that. And I will also post a link to the book we mentioned earlier that she contributed to, uh, which will be an amazing uh, learning experience for you. So Diana, I appreciate you so much coming on the podcast today to talk about this stuff and um, just thrilled, thrilled that you came on. Thanks, Elisa. It's been so good speaking with you. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast and would like to sign up to receive my blog posts and podcasts by email, you can go to alisachilders.com and click the subscribe button. Or you can simply subscribe to the Elisa Childers podcast on iTunes. 